Simone White has keynoted for me now at several events, both online and in person. And every time she speaks about the need for inclusion, we get so many emails about the topic and about her take on why assistants are excluded as a profession. We've invited her to talk on admin chat today about the session that she's about to do in Wellington in March, which is around the article that she wrote for us, The Need for Inclusion, and where she's giving us an update on what she is seeing in companies across the world and how you can advocate for yourself to eliminate the administrative profession bias. Will you please join me in welcoming the fabulous Simone White. Oh, Simone, how wonderful to see you. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Lucy. You know I love talking to you. Oh, thank you so much. Well, listen, we've only got just over a month until we're in Wellington. And I just really wanted to have a bit of a chat with you about your keynote there, because the keynote that you did along the same lines in South Africa last year went down an absolute storm. And I think it really opened people's eyes. So can you give us a sneak peek as to what you're going to be talking about in Wellington and talk to me about what inspired you to delve into this topic and why is it so crucial for the workplace? Oh, thank you, Lucy. I loved giving this keynote in South Africa. It was such an amazing experience for me. So let me think a sneak peek. Of course I can. I think actually you talked about what was the inspiration for the keynote, the need for inclusion. And in many things in life, I found in my life that actually it hasn't been that I've searched for something, it's come to me. And I guess Almost this article, which the keynote has come from, is exactly the same. So as an administrative professional for over 25 years now, I literally thought of myself almost in a silo format. It was me, myself and I doing a really good job, making sure that I was being recognised for what I did. I never really thought of myself as being part of a wider group. So it's kind of a... a I had a lack of awareness, so to speak, as to what was happening to the profession as a whole. In fact, I didn't see it as a profession. Now, it was only until something happened to a colleague of mine that I started to look into it as a profession. And that's how I started a network back in 2013. But even then, I wasn't really thinking about inclusion in those terms. I was more thinking about, oh, it's not really fair why assistants don't get promoted the same way or don't get training in the same way. And actually, my thought around inclusion was something that you led me to, Lucy, because you brought a couple of us together to write a white paper on the lack of diversity in the C-suite. And it was while I was looking at my thoughts around that that I came to realise that many of the things that happened to me as a black female and the feelings that I had also related to me as an administrative professional. Now, timing is everything when it comes to things like this. And this, when you asked us to do this paper, this was at the same time when the world consciousness around what was happening to black people was taking place. So it was that almost coming together of why are things happening to us as assistants that are not happening to everybody else? And why am I feeling this way as an assistant? It feels familiar. Actually, it feels like how I was treated as a black female. That's what made me think about it in the terms of inclusion, because that's what everybody was talking about. Why are black people feeling included? Why are they discriminated in a certain way? And all of those feelings I actually felt as an assistant. So that's where the article came from, the need for inclusion. And that's where this keynote came from as well, because as assistants, we are excluded. And that can be whether you're a male, female, no matter what colour you are. And it's such an important thing that we need to highlight to firms, because it's not necessarily that they're doing this on purpose purpose but they do have a lack of awareness of how we are discriminated against and I use that word quite 
quite meaningfully. <laughs> um, and if, if that word is quite heavy, why there is a bias to how we are treated? I think it's so interesting. And certainly when I talk to HR departments about it, they immediately go, <gasps> you know, because it's obvious as soon as you say it to me. But can you give me just for people who are sitting there, because there will be people sitting there who are watching who are going, well, that's a bit over the top, really. But can you give me an example of some specific instances or experiences that have highlighted for you the exclusion of assistance in areas that maybe other employees take for granted? And how did these experiences shape your perspective on inclusion? I totally understand when people might feel that's over the top, especially if they're in what I would call a privileged position to have never felt what discrimination feels like. But I like to also use the word awareness. So I'm going to give you an example of awareness in terms of something outside of the working um, world, and then I'm going to bring it into the working world because I think this helps people to relate. So I often say that I was never really aware of um, children who had to have something called a nasal gastric tube. So that's a little tube that they get fed from. I never had any view in my family of somebody who had that until my son had to have one. And then it raised an awareness of all of the things that parents who have a child like that has to go through. Now, when I walk down the road now, I see everybody who has a nasal gastric tube. So it's not to say I was ignorant to it, I just didn't have an awareness of the impact. Now I have an awareness, I can adjust accordingly. Think about that in our assistance space. So if I think about an example of the workplace where something happens automatically for others, but not so much for assistance, I will think of Let's look at our women's networks who are there to support women. How often in those networks are assistants who are majority women invited along? Or how often do they provide training specifically for the assistant profession, even though they're championing women? Let's think of it even broader. When we're talking about the workplace as a whole, and let's look at it in training as a whole. Are assistants given the opportunity to train in their specialist field in the same way that somebody else might? So if they're an assistant within the medical field, if they're an assistant within the finance world, if they're an assistant within education, are they given the same opportunities as other people who work in that space but have a different specialization to train. When we look at it that way, rather than like what I said right at the beginning on an individual basis, you really begin to see that maybe there is a bias in regards to how assistants are treated. I think it's really important that we understand it. And for me, I'm really interested in exploring what you think the underlying reasons are for this exclusion, you know, and whether there are steps that you feel organisations can take to redress the balance somewhat. I think there are a couple of things. It's not just one thing. So over my journey of leading a network, I have really had to understand the history of assistants or secretaries as they were known. And I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that secretaries were initially men. And the view of them was very different. And if we think about terminology that's still used today, if we think about the Secretary of State in the US, it's viewed as a, a very high position. And yes, we now have more females in those positions, but the majority of time that was men. When women then came on board, women themselves generally are viewed very differently by the world. So it stands to reason that organisations who are looking at their women, female population may not be looking at them in the same way. Now, we then have to layer on top of that. Yes, we have a lot about the inclusion of women, making them being seen on boards, 
But again, that's looking at very different roles than to that of the assistant. If we think about how major articles or how TikTok are highlighting that assistance being a lazy girl job, meaning that it's easy, you can do it with your eyes closed, or the Wall Street Journal talking about assistance being an executive's perk. Those things all play into that unconscious bias that we don't really need to look after this population or look at them because it's a stepping stone to another job. It's not really a career. Anybody can do it. I think the other things that organizations really need to look at is also their management structures. So if an organization always has assistance listed at entry level, so entry level is somebody who's just training, they need a lot of help, they, they are at the beginning of their careers. If no matter how long you've been an assistant for, you are always viewed as entry level and that will never change, why would HR take the time and effort to view you as talent? And so there are so many different elements that impact the view that organizations have. But again, it's all about raising awareness to those organizations to challenge them about that viewpoint. And does it sit right in organizations today? And, you know, I feel that very often the <laughs> businesses don't understand how big a population this is. Administration is the biggest employer of women. It's half a billion women worldwide, and admin makes up a fifth of the world's working population. So this isn't a small denomination of people. In fact, I quite recently saw a graphic um, that was on Facebook where it said if America was made up of 100 people, 13 of them would be working in administration. And that was based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics figures, which, as we know, only recognize the lower levels. So once you add in the assistants that are doing strategic stuff at a more senior level, we're looking at a lot more than 13, I would have thought. So really, to me, I think, what is this? What is this? Is the elephant in the room here that it's because it is the largest employer of women? I think that definitely does play an element because it is dominated by women. Um, mm -hmm. as, as all women, no matter where they work, are always looking at things like misogyny. Um, it impacts women in every single working field. But I think it really does impact assistance because of that historical bias in and I guess a lack of understanding about the fact that what we do requires skill. Mm. Because people feel there is no skill in it or there's not a talent to it. Then why nurture that? And we as assistants also have a lot to answer for if we ourselves are not viewing it as a talent. So if your firm is including you as a professional, but you don't show up or you don't attend the training or you think you don't need to, you are telling your firm that this is how you want to be viewed. So it's, it is, it's not a one size, one person solution. We need everybody to look at it just like we do with any aspect of inclusion. It's not something that one person or one organization can fix, but we all need to have an awareness of it. I agree totally. And, you know, it's so interesting. And I know we were talking before we started recording about the post that I did last week where we were saying that people, um, assistants are not glue or rock stars or magicians or, you know, any number of the other words that they were using to describe them. And I was really quite shocked at um, the number of assistants who came back and said, I like being called that. It's reflecting that they think I'm really good at my job, but actually <laughs> very nice to be patted on the head. But there's far deeper significance than that, right? Definitely. I mean, I I have no problem at all. One of the words I think in that post was Oracle. And it's quite I have to give you the story behind this just to, to make it sink in. So I was known at my firm, the Oracle. It was previously Google because it was, you could ask me anything and I would be able to give you the answer. You can type into Google, it finds the answer. It changed to Oracle 
because people realized that before they asked, I would be able to give them a response. But the only reason why I accepted that was because they also valued me like every other employee in the firm. It wasn't only that I was called the Oracle. I don't want to be called a rock star if I don't have rock star salary. I don't want to be called all of these other things or you're the glue that holds us together. But actually, when we are going to an offsite, I'm not included. So you don't need the glue then. These terminologies are only something to be celebrated if you are included in every other way. Otherwise, it is patronising. And we're not children, we are grown. And I think one of the things that was brought out in that article was being called a work mother or a work wife or a, there is no way that they would be having these terminologies to women in the C-suite. And one thing I always say is that women have been in the C-suite for a long time. It's just they've been administrative professionals and it's not recognised as, as an achievement to be in the C-suite if you're an administrative professional. So it's really important until the narrative around administrative professionals changes and we are valued in the same way and we're fundamentally viewed as talent, then platitudes like rock star or oracle or mother or wife, these things shouldn't be there until we have that equitable playing field. Oh, Simone, I love speaking to you always. You're so eloquent and it just it just puts into words the things that I'm thinking, but I can't always find the way to express them quite as eloquently as you do. So listen, in your session, will you be sharing any best practices or success stories from organisations that have really made significant strides in recognising and including their administrative professionals and doing the right thing? Can you uh, give us a bit of a preview? Definitely. I think... One thing that brought me into this journey, I've been on this journey for 12 years now, but I've been an assistant for 25. So it was hearing other people's stories and successes that made me think, wow, if they can do that, so could I. So it's really important that people understand no changes are made to marginalised groups by people who don't sit in the group marginalized groups have to get together and then get advocates and sponsors to make changes so we have to be the ones who are raising awareness and there are many firms including my own where we've raised awareness and changes are being made now some changes can be small some changes are that administrative professionals are now included in training whereas previously they may not have Others may be monumental, so it could be that career paths are created for them, and there are a number of organisations that have now done that, but that would not have taken place unless uh, awareness was raised by those it impacted. Just like I said, that I didn't really see anybody with a nasal gastric tube until my son had one. It wasn't that I was maliciously ignoring them, it just wasn't in my sphere of knowledge. So we need to raise it into the sphere of knowledge of our organisations that do you realise you have a group of people who are not included in the same way? Because I think then raising that awareness, you will then get traction. But definitely this will be something I'll talk about even more when we're I'm doing the keynote. Yeah, fantastic. And finally, Simone, what are your hopes for the impact of your session in um, Wellington in March? And what takeaways are you really hoping they'll go away with? I think I want people to see me as them. I am not a C-suite assistant. I have never been a C-suite assistant in a large organisation. I did not have really influential people who I supported who helped me initially on my journey, but I do now. Also, you don't have to be at the beginning of your career to make a change and view it as a career. Up until 12 years ago, it was a job. Now this is a career that I'm passionate about. 
don't let age be a barrier. Don't let how long you've been or how short a time you've been an assistant be a barrier and know that you can make change. It is possible. That's what I'm hoping people will be able to take from the keynote and be inspired by, because the more people that we get doing this globally, that's how we change perceptions. That's how we change the industry. Absolutely. And time is short. I keep saying it. We, I reckon, have got a year now until the businesses say, well, that is the world of work reimagined. We've done that now. So this is the way things are. So this next 12 months really is the window of opportunity to go and push for change. And really, as you said, it is the changes that come from the assistants themselves that are going to make the impact. Nobody else in the businesses is going to fight for this for them. No, but we have to start with us. So that mindset shift starts with us because we have to view us view ourselves as the professional when we step through the door in the terminology that we use, how we speak about what we do, and fundamentally understanding that if we say we are administrative professionals, we need to understand administration first and foremost. I couldn't agree with you more. It's always such a breath of fresh air talking to you, Simone. Thank you so much for this session. I know that it's going to really inspire all sorts of people all over the world to go and take action and start to have those conversations. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Lucy, for having me. It's been a great.